So in 1984, remember that year? I do. <laughs> it was the year after I graduated from high school. <laughs> in 1984, Tina Turner. You know who she is? Tina Turner came out with her hit song, which asked that all important question. Yep. I can still hear her raspy voice belting it out, that question. It's a question that the writer of 1 John is also addressing in this passage that I read this morning. That question is, what's love got to do with it? And in short, the answer to that question, what's love got to do with it, is everything, absolutely everything. 27 times in chapter 4 of 1 John, 27 times the word love or some derivative of love is used. Must be a pretty important message for us to get. Must be a pretty important idea for us to embrace. Must be a pretty important concept for us to apply to the way we live our lives. Love. Becoming love must be a pretty important reality for the follower of Jesus. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Absolutely everything. John reminds us that love first and foremost comes from God. Listen to how he says it in verse 7. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. God is the originator of love. And love marks us as God's children. Got it? Love comes from God, and it marks us as God's children. What's love got to do with it? Everything, absolutely everything. And we can, I'm going to ask that question several times too. And we can do just like uh, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We can, when I say what's love got to do with it? Everything, absolutely everything. Okay, got it? We'll get it. Our love for God must become flesh. That's what John's working at in this passage. That's what Jesus came to demonstrate. God's love in the flesh. And here's the deal, because our love for God must become flesh. It must be lived out tangibly and practically and dem dem demonstrably in, not demon, demonstra demonstrating demonstrably in the lives of, in, of the followers of Jesus and in our world. And John says, failure to love others invalidates our claim to know God. You said, he doesn't say that. Well, listen to this, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person's a liar. And for if we don't love people, we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters. So our failure to love others invalidates our claim to know God. Since our beginning as a congregation, way before Sharon and I, about nine years before Sharon and I, because when we got on the scene, this congregation was about nine years old, 10 years old, depends on who tells the story. So way before our being here, this congregation has sought to become known as an agent of love and blessing in our world, in our community. And it's no surprise because our denomination, the Church of the Brethren, is known around the world in very small ways as a denomination that rolls up our sleeves, gets our hands dirty, visibly and tangibly demonstrates the love of Christ to others. So it's no surprise that we're like that because that's who has formed us and who we are. 
So we have been long sought to be an agent, to become known as an agent of love and blessing in our community, and it is working. We are becoming known, as I like to say, as a little church with the big heart. We are becoming known as agents of God's love and blessing. We are not a point your fingers church. We are not a put down because you're different or because you believe something different than we believe. We're not a put down kind of church. We're not a push aside because you're not worthy of God's love or we don't like the way you live your life or we don't believe the things that you believe. We're not that. We're not a point your fingers. We're not a put down. We're not a push away kind of church. And there are churches like that. We are a roll your sleeves up, roll our sleeves up and jump in with the love, the tangible love, the love in the flesh, God's love kind of church. That's who we are. That's what John is telling us we should be as we become love. Now, I said earlier that this week has been a tough week for me, for us, for our community. On Tuesday morning, before I had heard anything of what had happened, my phone started blowing up. And no, my phone, it's still here. It didn't blow up, blow up like a bomb hit it. It blew up with text messages and phone calls. The first text message I got was from my friend Grace. Have you heard the terrible news? Well, no, I hadn't heard the terrible news. The next text message I got was from a fellow, a friend in the community who said, did Bull die? Bull is the downtown bike cop. I said, no, I have no idea. The next text message was from Try, who let me in on the terrible news. That sometime Monday evening, Tuesday morning, Bull, the downtown bike cop, I don't know why that didn't turn. There you go. That's bull. That he, for whatever reason, and we will never know the reason, took his life. That hit me hard. Because bull and I had become good friends. But it didn't just hit me hard. It hit us hard. It hit our community hard. We're reeling because he was the face of downtown Salisbury. That smile, that gregarious, that love, that joy that he brought, the way he could come up to you and engage you in a conversation having just met you. The way he remembered things about you and things that you liked and, and, and the way that he was. is what makes it hard. Especially hard to understand why who, for someone who smiled all the time, who oozed love and joy, and no one had any clue that he had struggles, at least struggles enough to go to that length. I knew he had struggles. He and I had talked about some of his struggles the week before in Old Town Delhi over coffee because we often did that. And we had worked at a way to begin to address some of those struggles. But I had no clue, no idea, no inkling that it was to that place that he would take his life. That was tough news on Tuesday. It consumed me. Somewhere in the midst of all of the text messages and phone calls that I made then, because I reached out to our mayor, I reached out to the chief of police. I reached out to other people who I knew Bull was special to and just told them, assured them that I was praying for them. Somewhere in the midst of that, our own Jean Tolls called me. She had heard. Someone had seen from our first service, had seen the news, had called Jean to tell her and Jean called me to reach out and see how I was doing because Jean herself had lost a son to suicide. That's love in the flesh. 
absolutely love in the flesh for Jean to pick up the phone and call her pastor, who she knew was struggling. The downtown community is reeling and still reeling, and the funeral was Tuesday, and it's at the Civic Center, and it will be huge. And we're, we're struggling, and we're going to struggle for a long time because this is not an easy loss for any of us. But I got a phone call from a person that I never met before, who I didn't even know on Tuesday, telling me that they were planning a downtown candlelight vigil on Tuesday night, the night the community learned of his death. And she wanted me to speak. I'm like, no, I can't. didn't have time. My schedule was full. I had an event at the Mac Center where I was sharing about the Camden Community Garden and I couldn't change that. The Institute for Retired People, I didn't think, I, I didn't want to ask them to not have something. I didn't know how they would communicate that to their people, you know, that were coming to hear me speak about the Camden Community Garden. So I, I just, I, and then I had something else right after that was over. And so I was like, I don't know how in the world I'm going to be able to get my thoughts together. And I felt like I had to have some kind of thoughts to share with the community that gathered, grieving, mourning, shocked at the news that we had all learned the incongruent news, the devastating news. And so I told Chris I didn't think I could do it because I didn't want to stand up there like a blubbering mess when everybody was looking to me to provide something. And yet after I told her no, I, I said the, the Spirit guided me somehow and I said, yes, I'll do it. I don't know what I'm going to say. It's a case in a time where I'm just going to have to trust God to give me the words. And you know, the interesting thing and the reason I'm telling you this whole story is that Chris didn't call me because she knew Bull and I were really good friends and had been good friends for about the last five or six years since I started doing a lot of work at Main Roots just hanging out there as a downtown office and then since Bull started operating as the bike cop downtown. She called me, she said. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. We'd never met. I don't even know how she got my phone number, but, you know, my phone number's not hard to get. But I, she called me on my cell phone. And she called me because she said she had seen my sunflower posts on Facebook. And she knew of the influence and the, the impact that we had in the Camden community through the garden. And she had seen a little bit about our connection with Pinehurst. And so she had this sense that if I came, I could do something, offer something to the community who was grieving. She didn't say it, but I also get the impression that she had the sense that I wouldn't be this kind of pastor that stands up and condemns Bull to hell because he committed suicide. Because I happen to believe, I happen to be a pastor who believes that God understands the kind of pain that would cause somebody to do that. And God is bigger than we are. And even though I couldn't stop Bull from doing that, somewhere in the midst of that journey from this world to the next, I believe God could reach out and meet Bull in the midst of that pain. And I believe God has welcomed him. And I said that at the vigil. Not in those kind of words. And I didn't even really remember saying that because I don't really know what I said. I only had time to think about exactly how I wanted to begin that night the rest of it I just trusted God for and God worked in marvelous ways and I had lots of community members come up to me and affirm the words I said the prayer I offered and I think they affirmed it all the more because I didn't stand up there reading something and I was grateful that I was able to trust God 
to speak to and through. And then on Wednesday, while I was waiting for Sharon, I dropped Sharon off for her physical therapy. It's been three times a week, except Friday we didn't do because we were out of town. But Wednesday, when I dropped her off, I went downtown. And I had to walk up and down what we call the plaza, but Bull called it the boulevard. In fact, it's going to be named the boulevard in his honor. We've already begun the process of talking to the mayor, and he's agreed. He agrees with it. And when I went down and walked up and down the boulevard, trying to grab some sense of understanding and trying to just connect and and work through my own feelings, I decided that one of the things I could do was to let love be enfleshed in me. And so I went into the places of business that I knew that were particularly close to Bull. And I simply said, I didn't ask, how are you doing? Because how is anybody doing? I knew. I knew how I was doing. And so I simply went in and said, hey, I'm just here to check in. I want to give you a big old hug. And that's what I did to several of the places that were important to Bull and to the people for whom they were struggling. And why did I do that? Because love leads, needs to be enfleshed in us. And because that's what Bull did. He was known for hugging people. Didn't matter who you were. Didn't matter if he just met you. Didn't matter if you were whatever color, whatever. It, it didn't matter. He just loved people and hugged them. You see, our love for God must take on flesh. That's what John's telling us. That's what Jesus came to tell us. That's what Jesus came to demonstrate. Actually, we're on the edge of the Christmas season. Yes, I know the commercial places have brought it in a month ago or a month and a half ago, but we are about to start the preparation of the Advent season and, and the Christmas season, which celebrates. It doesn't celebrate the gifts that we give and the things that we buy. It celebrates the gift that God gave us, his son, Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and came down from heaven in the, hor in the form of human, of a human. And he didn't just sit around the campfire and teach us about love. He demonstrated love. He was love in the flesh. He touched the people with demons. He touched the woman with a flow of blood that would make her unclean, that nobody was willing to touch because of the rules and regulations that the Jewish community had that you had to go through to become pure again after touching blood. He touched the people who were marginalized, who were put down and pushed aside. He didn't touch her, but he spoke with love to her, the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. When she and not her male counterpart was brought into the town square and put in the circle and they were going to stone her, he stooped down in the sand and drew. And then he said, to the crowd, he got up and he said, those that the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he stooped back down and drew in the sand. And when a time had passed, he got, he looked around and he said to the woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one thrown a stone? Has no one condemned you? Neither do I. Go and do not sin. He engaged her in love in the flesh. Our love for God, brothers and sisters, must take on flesh. That's why I was called Tuesday. Because I think the person who called me had this idea, had this understanding, even though we had never met. She had this understanding that I would embody love. Because that's who we are at Community of Joy. That's how we roll. A year ago, on Easter, our community suffered another devastating tragedy 
I don't know if you remember, but I remember it vividly. An estranged father went to his wife's home and killed her in front of their three children. And one of those students was a student at Pinehurst Elementary School where we are faith-based partners. And so as soon as I heard the news, I reached out to the principal and vice principal and just assured them that they were in my prayers and that I was there in any way I could be helpful. And so it was no surprise to me when the principal at the time asked me if I would come to the involuntary staff meeting that they, or the voluntary, not involuntary, voluntary staff meeting that they were having on Tuesday when they went back to school. And I said, absolutely, I'll be there. And th the principal at the time, I'm pretty sure, was not a person of faith. And I was kind of shocked when she uh, quickly, after we gathered, and that gathering was the largest prayer gathering we've ever had at Pinehurst Elementary School. The gymnasium was filled. It circled all the way around the gymnasium. We were so tight that we couldn't spread out and hold hands. We had to hold hands really close, but we formed a circle and she welcomed everybody there and then quickly turned it over to me. And I was like, what? I mean, I was just going there to be a presence. And yet again, I was invited to be into a role that I hadn't prepared for. But I was able to talk to the staff about that, and I have no idea exactly what I said, so I can't tell you what I said, but I know that I had some, some supportive comments and that I was there for them, and if there was any way I could be helpful, if you were struggling and you needed somebody to talk to, I'm there. And then I led them in prayer because that's what I knew we should do. You see, love's, what's love got to do with it? Everything, absolutely everything. And our love for God must become flesh, brothers and sisters. And I'm doing a lot of talking about the ways I embody and help God's love become flesh. But it's not just me, it's you. You have people in places that you're familiar with and that you go, that you can take God's love in the flesh with you when you go your classroom, your store, your daycare, your place of employment, Walmart, the mall. My goodness, right now, this season, we need to embody God's love in the flesh in the mall. You see, our failure to love others invalidates our claims to know God. God's love must become flesh. God's love, John tells us, gives us a power. It gives us a couple of powers. It gives us a power to overcome the world. Listen to the way, the way he says it in verse 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. As followers of Jesus who have experienced God's love in our lives, we have been given a spirit of power that is more powerful than the world. Nothing can overcome us, especially if we will embody love in the flesh. And secondly, John tells us that God's love gives us a power to overcome fear. Verses 16 and following. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. Brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus, God's love gives us the power to overcome even fear. 
And I'll tell you what, I was so grateful for that on Tuesday. Because I was dealing with that fear. What am I going to say? What if I stand up there and say nothing, have nothing to say? And then Satan, the evil one, however you want to name it, started speaking to me saying, who are you? Why did they ask you? What have you got to say? And to that I kept saying, because I've been reading this passage, Lord, you've got power over this. And I kept saying to myself, that's that phrase I say often, look up, look up. Don't look down. Don't, don't let those thoughts enter into your, into your being, into your body, into your mind, into your psyche. Just look up and trust that God's got you. You tell everybody that God's with you always. Trust him to be with you in the midst of this. You see, God's love gives us a power to overcome the world and a power to overcome fear. And he did. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me afterwards and thanked me for what I said and the impact of what that did at that moment in our community's time. I got a text message from Greg Bassett, who's the editor of the Salisbury Independent. He texted me and Mayor Jake Day and Mike Dunn and said to them, said to all three of us, said, I've got an assignment for you to write something about Bull for next week's paper. I need it on Monday. And I'm like, I don't know if I have time for that. I've got the sermon. I'm down in Virginia with family. Uh, I, I knew I wanted to go hunting yesterday. Um, and so, you know, I just, I said, I don't know. And he said, then he texted back a little while later and said, never mind. I got Martin's and Jake's. And I said, you got mine? What do you mean you got mine? I didn't send you nothing. He said, well, I got your words from the other night. And I'm like, you got my words? I don't even know what I said. How do you know what I said? He said, well, I got out my phone and started recording it. And, he sent, and so he sent me the recording of what, he, what, he, what I had said. And I listened to it. And I didn't get it all. And I asked him, I said, well, where's the beginning of this? Because I, I, I knew what I said in the beginning. Because those were the two sentences that I had time to think about and prepare. Because, you know, if you can begin something well and end something well, it doesn't matter what you say in the middle. I learned that in speech class. A long time ago. Now, that's not quite true, but, but in essence, you know, people remember how you begin and people remember what you end with. And so I knew how I was going to begin. I knew that I was going to say that we were all here tonight and we didn't want to be. Gathered on the boulevard. And there wasn't a one of us that wanted to be there, yet we all had to be there. Because in times like this, we need each other. And so I listened to what I said and listened to what the mayor said. And the mayor, I put the mayor in the position that I was put in. He didn't, he wasn't planning to speak, but he was standing behind me. And I just said, Jake, here, come say something at the end. Because I hadn't thought through how to end and it was awkward. Nobody wanted to leave. And he got up there and, and delivered a powerful message. And he, like me, he said in that text exchange, I have no idea what I said. And yet it was funny because one of the, it was powerful, actually. One of the things that Jake said ended up being quoted and is now going to become part of a bumper sticker. And you've probably seen it if you see my Facebook page cover. It's this... Uh, it's the bull with the uh, stripe through it, but it says... Um, I should have had this up. It says, love one another, love your community, laugh. Um, let me see. It's done all gone. Love one another, love your community, laugh when you can, and when you can, no, no, that's not him. Uh, that was Julian Sador. But anyhow, uh, I, I don't have that. Yes, I do. Let me get it because it's powerful. It's in my pictures. Yes, some people have, but not everybody has. So let me, let me go there. I didn't take too many pictures since I saved that one. Maybe I did. Um, here it is. 
Jake, Mayor Jake Day said, Bull wore body armor to work every day. There was about nothing else between his heart and every single one of us. He was talking about how you, not even body armor could separate the love that he had for our community, for the people of our community. And so uh, in that text exchange, it was just overwhelming to hear the power and the support and, and the ways in which what we said when we embodied love impacted those who were in that exchange and impacted our community. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Absolutely everything. You know, our love for God must become flesh, brothers and sisters. It's got to. And the first step toward that is to confess that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God. In verses 13 to 17, this is how John says that. He says, And God has given us his Spirit as a proof as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment when we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. And somehow when I was reading that, I missed it. Oh, so it's verse 15. Uh, All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and have God living in them. Um, And so, you know, the first step toward experiencing and embracing the love that God has for us is to embrace is to confess. And we talked about, that's how John began. We talked about that in week one. Talks about the bridge that confessing builds between us and God. Confessing that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God grounds us in the love that God has for us. That love that has to be demonstrated in our lives because God demonstrated it through Jesus. Before we can become love in the flesh, we must embrace or confess the love that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so my questions for you today are, have you embraced God's love for you? Have you made your confession of Jesus as your Lord? If not, What are you waiting for? Do it today. Begin the journey of becoming love. Because God's love has to be enfleshed in our lives. What's love got to do with it? Absolutely everything. I guess that's wrong. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Absolutely everything. There you go. So how do you want to respond? What thoughts? What? What? uh, Thank you. What stories, what, uh, what's going on in you that you want to talk about?